Sure. So uh, thanks a lot. And I, I really appreciated your overview. And I want to particularly highlight one thing, John, that you said. That's a big theme in what I want to say, which is that modest changes can often have large functional effects. That's going to be a theme that I'm going to develop. I'm not sure. There we go. OK, now I recognize my slide. So, I've been working in autism. In fact, Robin and I first met each other today in person, but we've been working together since 1995, <laughs> which is amazing that we it never laid amazing. eyes on each other before. But that's when I got involved with autism, analyzing a data set that Robin had been involved in generating, looking at brain changes in MRI, how big things were, how small they were. Um, and I've come a long way, and so has the field. Um, when I came into this field, we were told there'd be maybe three genes, then it was three to eight, then it was maybe 15. We're up to over 800 genes. So what do you do when you've got 800 genes? Then what, and there, and there, so not everybody has all 800 genes. So, you know, so most of the genes are probably of relatively small impact. They're not causes but they're contributors, and there's lots of combinations of things that probably lead to autism in most people. Some high-risk genes that mean that you're practically on the edge. It doesn't take much. Maybe the wings of a firefly to kick you over the edge. Um, it's also a whole body condition, not just the brain. And this is con consistent with mitochondrial issues. Kid can operate in many organs. Um, GI, immune, metabolism, hormones, stress. And the brain also, it's not just the brain wiring diagram. It's not just that the pathways were laid out differently, but the cellular health and the cellular energy level that we're coming to appreciate is important. And there's also indirect, there's also a sense that the numbers are going up, and could that be? that something environmentally is going on. And the mitochondria are quite environmentally vulnerable. So some game-changing observations that have emerged in the last number of years, I think, are very relevant to, uh, or at least potentially relevant to mitochondria. One of them is this observation, initially by parents, that's been followed up by research, that many children with autism, when they have a fever, they do a lot better. They may relax. They may make more eye contact. Some of them may even talk when they don't normally talk or talk more coherently and influently rather than in an echolalic way. Um, and one mom told me, my son is 18, and he doesn't do this anymore. But I used to look forward to him having a fever because then I could visit with my son. 10 to 20% or more may, may lose their diagnosis. And here's another story that it's hard for me tell, to tell straight of Susan Bryson, an autism, prominent autism psychology researcher in Canada, told a group of us that she'd had a 33-year-old low-functioning autism patient who went in for orthopedic surgery, and she had been nonverbal. She comes out, and her mother walks in, and she says to her mother, this is a nonverbal woman, I, I love you. I know I've been a big burden on you. And I want you to know that I'm sorry, but I'm very grateful. And, uh, and they looked at each other. And they had communion with each other. And they talked for a number of hours. And then it was, she went to sleep. And the mother left. She came back. And she, the next day, she was gone again. She couldn't talk. But if you get the sense that your child is in there, this is something I talk about in my book. Many people with autism do not believe those never moments because they can tell their child is in there. Um, there have been animal models uh, of autism that have been reversed, Rett syndrome, uh, tuberous sclerosis, and uh, fragile X have been reversed with molecular intervention, which has blown <laughs> the minds of geneticists because they've assumed that these were done deals, and they're not. And also, you really need to know that we now understand that people with autism are not mentally retarded or cognitively impaired. For the most part, they are normal, above average, or even superior in their intelligence. So 
I like an iceberg metaphor, which is that when you look at the social behaviors in autism, that's how we define it, but that's the tip of the iceberg. And underlying that are a whole bunch of systemic disturbances, including metabolism, and in many, including mitochondria. Now today, when I was being interviewed a few hours ago, I, I realized that this actually could be a metaphor for what we're talking about today, which is that you've got that iceberg, and see there are a couple of peaks there. Well, there could be a number of different peaks. There could be autism, there could be Parkinson's, there could be Alzheimer's, but the underlying body of the iceberg is much more coherent than there are so many commonalities among these conditions. So I'm just going to rip through this slide quickly because I, I really can't say, but there are many different ways that the body might affect the brain and autism and other conditions. So metabolism, there's inborn errors of metabolism, there's mito problems, and there's also injuries to metabolism over time from stressors environmental stressors and also inadequacies of diet. Immune activation. We're now learning the gut microbiome can be altered and can alter brain function. And this is finally hitting the big time, a recent re review article in Trends in Neuroscience is one of the top review journals of an idea that five years ago was much more marginal. Um, the the blood-brain barrier, the gut blood, gut blood and blood-brain barrier may be implicated, neurochemical issues, the vagus nerve, there are many ways that the body and the brain can relate to each other, and this is becoming more something that we can think about systematically. And I talk about this in my book, that's my book, The Autism Revolution, and um, I work through all these steps in a systematic way, all told through stories of people who got better. I work with a great journalist in writing that book. Now, mito disease is more common in autism than in the general population, and mitochondrial dysfunction is more common than the formally diagnosable uh, mitochondrial di uh, disorders. And I already mentioned that mito are extremely environmentally vulnerable. And there's also a phenomena of inflammation and oxidative stress that are common in autism. This is a picture of brain cells in inflammation. And what happens when brain cells are inflamed is that they set up a whole series of chemical processes that drive the synapse. You see on the bottom right, there's a bunch of yellow dots in the synapse between two neurons, and that's glutamate that drives neurons crazy, that astrocytes, the big green things, normally mop up, but when they're all activated like that, they can't do the housework. And all this garbage gets piled up, including glutamate that you don't happen to need. So what you're having is a lot of internally generated neuronal activity that is not about learning from the environment. It's about chemical imbalances inside the system. So let me go on and talk to you about what that, some of you, if anybody in the audience is an engineer, you may know that there's something called the signal to noise ratio. But everybody knows about it because if you talk on your cell phone and you only have two bars, you cannot hear very well and you spend all the time thinking about the cell phone and the static and you don't have a conversation. So that's lower signal and more noise. When you have more signal and you're on the phone, you don't even think that you're on the phone. You're just having a conversation. And one of the things that's really interesting about some people with mitochondrial disease is that on some days they have autism and on other days they don't. Um, so why could this be? And I just want to walk you through. So in the brain, and, and, and John already talked about the mito use so much energy, but the, the synapse to send a signal has to use a lot of mitochondrial energy. So if your mito are having problems, there's less energy. You can get weaker signals. Weaker signals may be related to smaller networks. I'm laying out a model for you. This is not all worked out step by step. But I think it's a plausible model that can motivate research. When you, and, then I also, and when you have mito problems, you also can get a buildup of excitotoxicity like those glutamate yellow blobs that I was showing you in the previous slide. So one of the results of this is inefficiency in the way the nervous system works. 
And you're not only having less energy, but you're using what you're having in a less efficient way because it's not all being used to, gen to process information. A lot of it is just noise. So, and, and, but, there's, but this can be, again, variable from day to day. And many of you know that your kids have better days and worse days. This is some research from our own team. And it's, I want to just show you what this means. So on the left, we're looking at power in EEG, where there's more power, the red one, in the autistic group than in the controls. But on the right, the red one is on the bottom. So you've got less coherence and less coordination. So I think of it like what Shakespeare said, sound and fury signifying nothing. A lot of activity, but not organized and not coordinated very well. And so too much power, less coherence, too much noise, not enough signal. So, and I already mentioned that in some with minor disease, autistic symptoms show up on, on rougher days than others. And in, in a way, this suggests that at least some people with mito disease may be teetering on the edge of a, of a metabolic balance or imbalance that's just, they're not, you know, in system theory, you'd say metastable. They're neither here nor there, and they can tip both ways. And it suggests that mito problems may actually contribute to creating the brain state that produces the autism. So it may, again, not be just a wiring diagram, but something that's happening every microsecond of every day, and that over time when you change that state, smaller things may make a bigger difference. And this is a study that happened uh, that was not about MITO, but a proof of principle by giving a drug that reduced stress in the brain was able to improve brain connectivity in like 20 minutes, where people in the genetics field are looking for the genes that cause a permanent lifelong chain reduction in brain coordination by giving this drug. And I'm not saying this drug is a cure for autism. It just shows that the brain can improve when you change its metabolism. It can improve fast. Not that you can necessarily re retain that improvement, but it's like the woman who could talk and then it went away. The capability, it, it, when you, like again, like I said, when you think your child is in there, they probably are. <coughs> so, what do you do about that? Well, I am really excited at all the research and the mitochondrial specific drugs that John was talking about. But in the meantime, I really think that little things that you can do in your daily lives with your child can make a really big difference. Because mitochondria are dependent on optimal nutrition. They need a lot of fuel. So eating high nutrient density f food with rainbow colors so you get many different kinds of phytonutrients which are informational chemicals for your body and brain, is an insurance policy that gives us a strong foundation. Good food, without this, you have, a, you, have you run out of supplies. Uh, with this, you can do better, you raise the bandwidth, minimize the toxins that put more of a strain on the mito than there's already there. Why make things even harder when you don't have to? And, and really be sensitive to the amount of information that someone can take in. And when their threshold is hit, when it becomes too much, and then any new information becomes a stressor. So in my research, I do brain imaging. And I'm working on techniques where we can measure metabolic products related to mitochondria and also to oxidative stress. But not just for their own sake, but I'm really interested in seeing whether when those change from interventions, whether other measures that we have of brain signaling can be impacted by that as well. And we'll, we are starting to look at dietary and other interventions, which depending on how severe the dysfunction is, may contribute to improving the, the moving things in a reversible direction, the way John talked about. Uh, I want to talk about one more thing before I finish. This is an amazing study that came out this year where Rett syndrome was reversed in a mouse model, but they didn't go after. This isn't even necessarily mito. They, went, they didn't go after the neurons. They didn't go after the, these other cells, the astrocytes. 
they basically did a bone marrow transplant of the microglial cells. Now, they were in my cartoon. They were the little blue ones on the right, but I didn't point them out. The animals got better for a calendar year, which is an enormous length of time in the life of a mouse. So they played around to see what was it that they did to these micro, what, the, what was it that the microglial cells were doing that if you stopped it, the mics would get sick again. And what it was was phagocytosis, which means taking out the trash. So they were basically clearing debris from these animals, which I think suggests to me, and I just want to plant this idea for you to think about it, that genes cause very specific deficits, but they also cause an inefficiency in the organism, which makes it hard for it to take care of itself and that may itself con may contribute further to the problem. So uh, where I think we're going is a greater sense of connectivity in science that we now know that genes and mito and all these things are in vast networks and things influence each other. And we, so that many, so again, as I say in much more human detail through stories in my book, Every stressor that you can take out of the system can help other parts get better, and every piece of support that you give can help things get better, too. So thanks a lot, and this is my book and, and my websites, and thank you very much. Dr. Herbert, thank you very much. You guys are great storytellers. I mean, from the firefly to the iceberg and the, the peak in the body and then to the bars of my cell phone, I mean, I'm, I get a pretty good picture. You guys are, you guys are doing a great job. Uh, thank you, Dr. Herbert. We appreciate that.